Okay, we are at 2.30 on the dot, so I assume we're good to go. We are good to go. Oh, hey, there's the sign, begin. Hello, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today with Zibionic as well, talking about CADA, which is the real-time and serverless scaling solution for Kubernetes, a CNCF incubations project. We'll jump right into it. We only have half an hour plus a little bit, and we wanna leave plenty of time for Q&A. Thank you to all of you who might be joining virtually. Hello to you as well. I can feel your strength through that little camera in the back. I um, can you feel it too? I don't. Oh, all right. Well, maybe after we get through intros. So very quickly, who are we and why are we so excited about Kata? So I'm Jeff Holland. I am a director of product right now at Snowflake, the data cloud company. And prior to Snowflake though, I worked at Microsoft for about 10 years and part of my time at Microsoft involved a partnership with Red Hat uh, when we created and founded Kata as a project. This would have been, I don't know, three or four years ago at this point. Uh, you can find me on the socials at Twitter or LinkedIn. If you have any questions or just want to connect, more than happy to chat with you there. At Microsoft, I was working on a bunch of the serverless tech like Azure Functions, Azure Container Apps. And so scale was a key part of that, which is part of what inspired us to be like, oh, how can we make scale better in Kubernetes all up? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, hello, everyone, again. I'm very happy to be here on stage. Jeff is great. And to talk about Keras. So my name is Zbigniew Grubarik. I'm based in Brno, Czech Republic, which is in Central Europe, in case you don't know. Uh, I'm a software engineer working on Red Hat. And as, as Jeff mentioned, we are quite um, cooperating on Keras for some time. Uh, so I'm Keras maintainer and also active in a native community. I'm part of the TOC board, and uh, my main focus uh, is Kinetic okay. Functions. It's a cool project, uh, so you should check it out, definitely. But now let's talk about Kira. Great. And it's crazy that you flew halfway around the world and are facing jet lag, but you were here plenty of time in advance for the session. I flew from Seattle, and I ran in here five minutes ago. So credit to you, I guess. You, you did a great job, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, you can imagine how good of a PM I am if I can't even show up. Five. Like, what, if, what is a PM if not somebody who creates slides? Um, and speaking of slides, we'll jump right into it. So we're going to talk a little bit about what Kata is. We're going to show a demo fairly early on. And then we're going to show you a little bit of behind the scenes of how Kata works. And we've got some really exciting stuff to share in terms of what the community is building moving forward. And as I mentioned, we'll have questions at the end. So if you can hang on to them there, we will answer questions then. So starting with framing Kata, I like to use this analogy, which is let's compare two, two scaling stories. And here's the task, let's say that I have. So my, my task right now is there's a KubeCon party happening tonight. If you're not invited to one, come reach out to me. I'll give you an invite. There's like seven of them happening, probably more. And here's the goal. You need to provide enough pizza to feed as many people as show up at a KubeCon party. Now you have two strategies here. One is you show up with one pizza to start with and you put it down on the table and then you just look at that pizza and you wait until that pizza box is empty. And when the pizza box is empty, you're like, okay, well, I guess we need more than one box. So then you leave and you come back with two boxes of pizza and then you watch those two boxes of pizza and you wait till they're empty. And then you come back with four and then you come back with eight. You could do that, it would work. The party attendees will be ticked off at you because if there's 100 or 200 or 300 people there, they're going to be waiting an hour, two hours plus while you run back and forth getting a bunch of pizza I'll boxes. be on the other party back then, you know. Yeah, you would have left. You would have been like, I'm going to the other party. I'm going to the AWS Kubernetes party down the road or whatever one you're going to. Now, here's strategy number two. This is what a product manager would hopefully do. I'm going to find out how many people are projected to come to this party and then I'm going to make an informed decision based on how many pizzas I think I need based on that. So if there's 100 people, I'll be like, okay, 10 pizzas is maybe enough. Maybe I'll go with 12 to be safe. And so I'll show up to the party with 12 boxes of pizza. And if there's 1,000 people, I'll show up with 120 boxes of pizza. Now, if you were in charge of providing pizza for a party, which strategy you're going to go with? I think everyone's going to go with strategy number two. But the funny thing is, when it comes to scaling our applications, we so often go with strategy number one. We deploy an application and then we just watch the CPU and the memory. And we wait for all the CPU and the memory to get eaten up and then we're like, okay, well, I guess we need some more. And so we'll give it a little bit more and then we just sit there and watch. And it is not an efficient way to do things. So I am pleased to share that Kata is the better pizza way to scale your containers Woo! because Kata 
Yes, thank you. It's a beautiful analogy. It makes me very hungry. I love pizza. Uh, so Kata makes it so that your Kubernetes cluster is much smarter at thinking about how to scale things because it will scale based on the events. What is causing the consumption in the CPU and memory? So it integrates with over 55 different event sources from information from Prometheus, event sources like RabbitMQ, Kafka, AWS SQS, Azure Event Hubs, GCP PubSub, Postgres. You can go to kata.sh and see a massive list of scalers, and that list grows two or three every single time we do a Kata release. So this is a really useful pattern because it makes it so you can scale your workloads based on the events, the cause of the consumption, and not the reactive way that we've been trained to scale so long before. And what I love about Kata is just how seamlessly you can pop it into any architecture in any Kubernetes cluster. So let's show you this in action before Zibionek walks through some of the architecture. So we're gonna do a quick demo here. This is my Hello Kata demo. I wanted to make it as simple as possible. We have a RabbitMQ queue. There's a lot of fantastic queuing. You could swap this out with Kafka or whatever you want. I'm just using RabbitMQ because it's the easiest for me to, to install on a cluster. And I'm gonna deploy a container, which is just consuming messages from that queue. Fairly simple. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add Kata to the mix. And Kata is gonna do two things. One, it's going to go ask RabbitMQ, how many events do you have that need to be processed? How many people are waiting in line to get into this party? And then based on that information, Kata is going to scale our application based on those events. And it does that scaling through the horizontal pod auto scaler, the HPA that we all know and love. It's not doing its own magical scaling thing behind the scenes. We'll talk about that in the architecture. So you'll see how Kata will scale this. One thing I wanna call out here right before I show the demo, the application has no idea that Kata exists. Just like in Kubernetes, it's not aware that it's running in Kubernetes or if it's in a laptop. It just wakes up and says, start giving me messages. So Kata is able to pop right in there. I didn't change my code in any way, but it's able to enrich the scaling logic based on knowing, in this case, how many messages are on that queue. So let's see it in action. This is the deployment manifest that I'm using, beautiful, beautiful YAML. You can see I just have a very simple container here. It's complaining because I'm not requesting any cores or memory. That's the squiggly yellow lines here. But I'm just deploying a container. And what Kata is having me define is this custom object next to it, which is this Kata scaled object. And this is where I tell, tell Kata about the event source and what I want it to scale. So I say, I want you to scale this RabbitMQ container and I'm gonna scale it based on events coming from RabbitMQ. And I mentioned there's like 60 of these that I could choose to scale it on. I'm telling it to kind of target about five messages per container. That's like saying how many pizzas per people. So I'm saying every container, go for about like five messages. Um, I tell it the queue to listen to, and I can even describe an authentication parameter so that it, Kata knows how to securely ask RabbitMQ how many people are in line. Okay, so this is what I've already deployed in my cluster. So let's see that here. So I can now, at this point, my queue is empty. I'm going to go ahead and say, sorry, let me zoom in here. Oh no, you can see the last time I ran this, which has spoilers. Okay, so right now, my container is running one beautiful thing. It's scaled all the way to zero. This container is actually not consuming any CPU in my cluster because Kata is smart enough that it's looking at that RabbitMQ thing and it's saying, there's no messages here. Why waste the CPU cycles? So Kata has helped this scale all the way down to zero. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to add a quick job, which is gonna publish, I can't remember, 1,000, 10,000 messages onto this RabbitMQ queue. So now let's watch this in real time. And you'll notice even before I finish talking, Kata now sees, oh shoot, there's actually a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of people who need some CPU. So very quickly, before the first CPU cycle even got hit, Kata has already helped me scale up to, you can see I now have four instances of this container up and running. And even before I finish that sentence, now it's gone to eight. And it will continue to scale and scale and scale because I told it, hey, if there's a thousand messages in the queue, I want you to target about five five messages per container. So it's now helping get to that state where it's able to handle the workload as I described it. So you can see very, very quickly, I've been able to horizontally scale my services. Now what I wanna do quickly here as well, is show you what happens if something goes wrong. So I have defined one more piece here, which is some fallback logic. 
that says, if the connection to RabbitMQ fails, what do I want to do? Does it now scale all the way to zero and my application blows up? Well, I, I wrote this fallback logic to say, you know, if something goes wrong, just run it for, run it for replicas. That's a pretty safe spot to be. So let's make something go wrong. Let's uninstall RabbitMQ from this cluster that we've been talking to. And so you can see here, my RabbitMQ just got terminated. And as soon as it got terminated, Kata realized, uh-oh, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to ask RabbitMQ how many messages it has. I'm not getting any answer back. Who knows why it might've failed? In my case, it failed because of user error. But what you'll see here as I finish talking is that it's gonna end up in that fallback mode. Hopefully it will. Well, the containers are now unhappy because they also can't talk to RabbitMQ. But you can see here if I, I'll switch to a view where you don't have to look at all of the errors. It's now trying to run with four instances. So it, it, it's even Kata's helped this fall back into a state where it's like, okay, if something went wrong, I can fall back. Now, I, I won't walk through this now, but if I just add RabbitMQ back into the mix, everything will go back into a healthy state. It'll go back to consuming whatever messages might still be there and, and going there. So hopefully that made sense. I had a simple container. I told K to scale this container based on events from RabbitMQ. It very, very rapidly got to the right amount of containers I needed to consume all those messages. And then I even have some nice features here like fallback to make sure if something goes wrong, my whole application isn't just floundering because uh, this doesn't know what to do. So I think at this point, we might even be at a healthy state. We'll get there soon enough. So that's a quick hello world demo. Very, very kind of simple to see. Any container can now point to Kata. So with that, Sibine can walk us through a little bit of the architecture. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. That was great. Awesome demo. So uh, I hope that by now you have some understanding how Kata works or what it does actually. So we can take a look at the architecture. So Kata is built on top of Kubernetes. So we are trying to reuse as much components and concept from Kubernetes. So to not so to not do the you know uh, the stuff that has, yeah, re has been reinvent done. things that already exist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and the main component is scaled object or scale job. This is the main resource where we define the metadata for scaling. You have seen that in the demo. So, uh, let's say that if we go back to the demo, uh, what happened if I uh, create a scaled object in, uh, in my cluster? Uh, there are two main components of Keda. The first one is Keda operator or controller. This is this box. And the second main component is Keda metrics adapter or Keda metrics server. So, once Jeff created the scaled object, the Keda operator spotted this resource, and based on the metadata defini definition, it creates uh, HPA with the, with the proper metadata, with the proper scaling, etc. And then it, uh, it checks the scale object again and see uh, what kind of scaler has been used for, for this scale object. So in this case, it was RabbitMQ. So it creates a scaler object, which is basically an adapter that talks to the external service and queries for, for the metrics. So it, it creates the sc scaler, talks to the external service, and posts the metrics. And finally, um, because as, as Jeff mentioned, we rely on HPA for the auto-scaling, but HPA cannot scale down to zero. It is not able to do that. So we need to do that from the, from the Keda side. So Keda operator uh, does the scaling from zero to one. We call this phase an activation phase, and you can even specify a specific threshold for this. So in, in a moment that there is like a, the threshold in, on, the, on the queue, it will scale up. In this case, when we are on one replica of our target application, then the second main component kicks in, and basically it's a, it's a metrics adapter that's registered on Kubernetes endpoint, and it feeds the external metrics from the scaler to the horizontal pod autoscaler. So there is a horizontal pod autoscaler controller in Kubernetes, and it asks for metrics, and we are providing them through, the, through this interface. Again, it's a standard Kubernetes stuff, so we are trying to, to be transparent in this. So I think that that's the, that's the main logic, quite simple. And the one thing, just to call out, uh, and I know I mentioned this a few times that I love about Kata, is you can pop in that operator without impacting anything else. So you might have already 50 containers running in a cluster. You go and install the Kata operator. At first, nothing's going to change. And maybe now two of those 50, you're like, yeah, scale these based on events. Those two are still going to be scaled via the HPA, as Zibiak mentioned, but now they're going to be enriched with all this extra data from Kata. So this makes it a really nice design to incrementally adopt as you want without worrying about like, oh, shoot, do I have to now have like a Kata-flavored Kubernetes cluster? It doesn't work like that. It's, it's very much just doing its thing on the side. You pull it in when you need, and you ignore it when you don't. 
Yeah. So there are two main resources to define the scaling. So the first one is scaled object. Basically, with scaled object, you can target any deployment, stateful set, or any custom resource that uh, implements this specific sub-resource. It's called scale. So we can target, uh, target it here. And um, second main part of the scaled object is basically the trigger section. So in this case, it is a Kafka trigger section. So it says, OK, uh, let's, uh, let's scale this deployment based on the messages in this Kafka topic. We can have multiple uh, triggers in this, in this trigger section. And in this case, we are sending all the matrix from, from this particular trigger. So it could be Kafka, RBDMQ, Prometheus, all targeting the same deployment. And we are sending the metrics over to HPA. And HPA does the decision on, on the scaling itself. So it, basically, at the moment, it selects the highest value from, from, all, the, from all the metrics. The second component is called scale job. Uh, this one is, is very good for, for long-running processes. So basically, it does not uh, scale an application or deployment, but it, uh, it, but it schedules a Kubernetes job based on, based on the events happening in the external system. So it's the very same trigger section. So again, the, the Kafka topic with, with a threshold. And instead of specifying a target, we can put plain Kubernetes job uh, definition, and it will, it will create the, the Kubernetes jobs based on that. This is very important aspect because if you have some long running application that it processes some data from the external system and it takes hours to process the actual stuff, if you use the HPA approach, the HPA may actually kill your application during the processing because the metrics are already gone, but the application needs more time to process the stuff. So in this case, you should use scale jobs and to spawn, spawn the scale jobs based, based on the metrics. This is just an example because uh, what we are trying to achieve with Keda is, is simplicity. Is, is simplicity from the user perspective. So as a user, I don't want to deal with you know configuring all the stuff on Kubernetes. I just want to plug Keda in, create scaled object, and do the scaling. So this is an example. On the left hand side, you can see a scaled object. On the right hand side, you can see basically the HPA uh, with uh, with some custom metrics. So you can you can actually implement this on your own. You can target the very same endpoint endpoint in Kubernetes. But you will, do, you will need to do all the, all the stuff that you don't want to do. So we are trying to, to make this very simple. Uh, yeah, and let's talk about some advanced features. So you have already seen the fallback in the demo. This is cool. Uh, also, what is, uh, what is nice, this is HPA, scaling behavior. This is upst upstream, Kubernetes, uh, upstream HPA stuff. Um, it's, it's very important because sometimes the metrics may go up and down, up and down. So the replica number may be may be flocking as well. So you, you would like to you know avoid this situation. So in the scaling behavior, you can specify a window, uh, which will be used for selecting the target uh, target replica number. Uh, other cool feature is uh, pausing of auto scaling. So imagine that you have your deployments, your applications, it is scaling, everything is perfect, but you would like to do some maintenance and you don't want to remove the scaled object from your cluster. What you can do, you can just annotate the scaled object with the annotation and pause the auto scaling for, for the time, for the, for the outage or whatever. Um, we also think that auto scaling is, is nice, it's fun if you have it in a cluster, but if you have many, many, uh, many scaled objects in your cluster, it's hard you know, to get uh, be on the picture of what's happening in the cluster, actually. So observability is, is very important for us. So at the moment, can I expose some Prometheus metrics about what is happening, what, it's, what it does, how it does the scaling, but we are still trying to improve, improve on this area. And yeah, and last thing I would like to highlight is that, um, as you have mentioned, we have like 50 plus different scalers, but uh, if, if those scalers are not right for you, you can implement your own. Uh, and you can use, uh, it's called external scaler interface. It's basically a gRPC interface. And if, if you implement this interface, you can implement your own scaler with your own logic and just plug into Keda. And uh, Keda is written in Go. If you don't like Go, you can write it in .NET, Java, whatever, and just use gRPC to, to talk to Keda to do the scaling for you. If you want to know more about the spec, this is the link for, uh, to the documentation. And last but not least uh, is the authentication. It's important, right? So, because if you if you if you need to talk to some external services, uh, you need to store the credentials somehow, and most likely you don't want to store them directly in scale object in YAML. So, you would like to have some reference. So, there was a reference on the trigger authentication object. So, it basically can hold references to secrets, vaults. Uh, you can even use pod identity, 
and uh, it's namespace based. So you can have a one trigger object, trigger authentication object in a namespace and reference it in multiple scale objects. Or you can use cluster wide trigger authentication and this is useful. You, for example, you are admin on the, on the cluster, you can set up the cluster trigger authentication, authentication object in one namespace with all the credentials and the users that will do the actual scaling that will create the skill objects can just reference to this uh, cluster trigger authentication object without even knowing what are the credentials. So you are not exposing the data uh, to more, more users than necessary. Okay, so that's the current state. That's the, what, what we have with Keda. It works, it's awesome. But what's next? So the first point I would like to highlight is that at the moment, we are just feeding the metrics to HPA. So if you recall, that was the uh, two main components, CADA operator and CADA metric server. So we are just sending the metrics over to, H, uh, to HPA through the metric server uh, every time that HPA asks. Uh, but this might not be the best case if you have tons of scaled objects in your cluster and maybe all of them are targeting the same external service. So for example, the same Prometheus server. So there could be, there could be like a very high load on this, on this server. So uh, once we are able to cache, cache the metric values in the, uh, in the metrics adapter, we are able to tell Keda not to ask for metrics every time, but you know, store them and give, give, some, give some value later. The other cool stuff that we can do with the, with the caching is we can do some magic uh, with the actual numbers. So once we, have, once we know what are the actual metrics coming in, the, in some period of time, we can do some maybe some smoothing, some, some AI, ML models, etc. cetera. Um, do you want to follow up? Yeah, on the, uh, for custom logic with evaluating multiple triggers. So in my example, my container just had a single trigger listed in that list, which was RabbitMQ. You can actually provide multiple of those. You could say like RabbitMQ and CPU and memory and this cron task or something else. Now the challenge with that is when it creates it behind the scenes and it actually goes and registers all that with the Kubernetes autoscaler, the HPA, it's going to be publishing all those metrics and we leave it up to the HPA to decide when to, whether or not to make a scaling decision. And usually today, I think Zubinik was mentioning, it just goes, whatever number is the biggest, yeah. that's the one it's gonna prioritize. And so moving forward, we also have some asks to say like, hey, can I have some more customized logic here? Maybe I wanna take the average of a few different uh, s sources. Maybe I wanna prioritize one over the other. And so doing more of that logic on the CADA side um, that we can give the HPA just the info that it needs to make the scaling decision. On the cloud event side, as I've been mentioned, these last two are actually related to the aspect, you know, we integrate very cleanly with Prometheus today, both from a emitting Prometheus metrics for you to operate, but also scaling based on a Prometheus time series query. Um, we also want to integrate with cloud events so that if you, uh, Kata itself can emit cloud events. So when something happens, Kata emits cloud events, but also there's an issue of understanding, hey, how could we scale things based on cloud events that might be coming from other systems? Similar story with open telemetry, having that same, there's an open telemetry scaler being worked on right now. So you can make scaling decisions based on telemetry from open telemetry and deeper integration with that. Uh, and then finally, this open interface for predictive auto scaling. Yeah, that's another cool feature. Um, Basically, because we, have, we are getting the metrics from the external system, so we can, we can try to do something with them. So we are thinking about introducing some interface that we can plug some AI MM model, for example, and based on the incoming metrics, we can predict the actual, actual state. So we can say uh, that we would like to autoscale the application you know, every Monday because of the, uh, of the prediction. At the moment, we have one, one, uh, one, one scaler that is doing this stuff, but it is like a talking to some external service, but we would like to do it like an open way. And another uh, important thing is uh, environmental impact. I know these days it's, it's very important stuff, as we know all the situation is happening around the world. So we are actually uh, cooperating with, with the CNCF uh, Environmental Sustainability Group that's uh, trying to solve issues related to this, to, this, uh, to this problem. So we have done a POC actually uh, that um, will integrate with CO emission intensity or power consumption or similar data and uh, use the data to actually modify the CADA scaling decision. So in this, in, this, uh, in this specific POC, what we have done is that um, based on the carbon impact, 
uh, we can uh, we can cap the actual maximum replica numbers that we will we will uh, auto scale to. So basically, if if the if the if the if the carbon stuff is is looking very bad, so let's not scale to 100 replicas, but just you know to to for example 10 rep 90 replicas or something like that. So this is the POC that we have done. Uh, it is not. This approach, it is like a separate controller, but we would like to see in the future something like this directly in the, in the scaled object. You can check the, the POC here. There are links and, links and recordings. And there are also some, uh, some talks at KubeCon about, about this stuff, so you can, you can check them in the schedule. Yeah, and all the slides that I'm showing here are uploaded to, to SCED as well, so you can click the links if you want. This is something I, I really love. This is something that has been, uh, I, I've spent a lot of time in, in the serverless space, and I know a, a, a long time ask has been, hey, I love the elastic scale of my serverless compute. I would love to be able to control that scale so that I'm utilizing energy efficiently. Maybe if the data center is under heavy load or there's a lot of carbon emission, delay, like don't schedule my jobs right now. This notion of being able to have scale rules, not just based on the events themselves, but the environmental impact and the environmental environment that those are running in I, is super important. So all of these things that we've talked about in terms of what's next, all of these are great opportunities for contributors. Huge thanks to the community. I've been blown away. If you go to kda.sh and you just start scrolling, about halfway through, you'll just hit a wall of logos of just like yeah. all of the amazing companies and people and organizations who've been involved in helping make Kata great. Um, so for those of you who are here who are a part of that community already, have been contributing, opening issues, providing feedback, huge thank you from Zibinek myself and the rest of the maintainers who can't be here. And for those of you who are interested, this is a really great project to go collaborate with because it really is, it just does one thing. It's not a full-fledged serverless platform. It's not doing TLS termination and event. Like that's great, there's a space for that. Go contribute to those as well. But Kata, it's like, I'm just gonna do scaling. I'm gonna do it really, really well. I'm gonna make sure you show up to the party with the right amount of pizzas and everyone is happy. Yep. So thanks everyone so much for your help and, and, and with this. And I think at that point, Yes, before we go to questions, please submit your feedback on the session. Yeah. So if you want to snap the QR code and let us know uh, what you thought, hopefully they'll invite us back for more KubeCons in the future. We can share some of the more exciting features um, or let us know if there's things you'd like to see done differently. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, do you have any questions? We'll go right here in the front. I don't see any mic, so just speak up and then I'll repeat it so that everybody can okay. hear. Oh, oh yeah, or if Sibina even wants to run around. Uh, actually, I have a question. Uh, yeah, my name is Stan, and I have a question uh, like, uh, what is the interval that you set for the Prometheus server for like uh, scraping the metric? Because uh, usually I use like 15 seconds, and mm. uh, is, is that impact scaling? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, another question about like K-native. How, how, how does it compare to K-native? Sure. Uh, so all, uh, actually, you can answer, answer I can answer, you're on the I oversight can answer, committee. I can answer both questions, it's fine. Yes, go for it. Uh, so the polling interval that's, that's there, that's for the activation phase only. That's only for the operator. So this is for the initial, initial scaling. So this is for the zero to one. Then it is up to HPA to ask for, for this interval. And HPA, the default value is, if I'm not mistaken, 15 seconds. But what we are trying to do, we are, with the, with the cache, we would like to also, also create like this interval for, for the HPA also. So we will like send the metrics only in the, in the specific time. But at the moment, it is just for the, uh, for the initial. Zero to one, yeah. yeah. And you can see like here, I, for my demo, I said ask every five seconds to RabbitMQ. You can configure this to 15 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds. But to Xavier's next point, once it goes to one, then the HPA will just ask on some period, like what's the latest metric? And Kata will go and fetch it and bring it back for the HPA. Yeah, and the, the other question, uh, yeah, it was like, K it was the K-native and Kata. Yeah, that's a good question. I quite often get this question. Um, it could be a long talk, but I'm trying to do it in a short way. So basically, I don't see K-native and Kata as, a, as a, like competitors but it's more like a complementary tool. So because uh, in a messaging systems, there could be like two ways how to deliver data. It could be pull-based approach or push-based approach. So the pull-based approach is basically that the application needs to handle the connection to the external source. So let's say we have an application that talks to the RabbitMQ. So in my application, I need to open the connection and manage all the data delivery to the application. This is the pull-based approach. So this is where Keda works. 
And on the other hand, the push-based approach is that the application uh, doesn't need to care about like opening the connection, et cetera. It is just waiting for incoming requests. So both approaches as like pros and cons, you know, it depends on the, on the use case that you have. So for example, if you would like to auto scale your application based on incoming HTTP requests, because HTTP requests by its nature are push based, mm -hmm. it's very hard to achieve it with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with HPA and with Keda with this approach. So in this case, I would, I would choose Knative. But also Knative and Keda, they are like, Keda is, ver is just auto scaler. We are trying to do the auto scaling that's simple. Uh, with, with Keda, it's more like a serverless platform, so you can do more stuff, you can do like separate com configuration, eventing stuff. So it really depends on the, on the use case. It's a like complementary tools. Yep, great. Makes sense? Yeah. I think, yeah, back here at like the third or fourth, I think, was the second hand up, at least when we asked for questions. Uh, thanks. I, uh, I have a question about uh, what's the suitable workload type uh, that is um, Keta is most appropriate uh -huh. for because I assume those events in the event queue should be homogeneous, but what if they are not? What if they are heterogeneous jobs? And um, in your example, there was like four jobs or four events uh, handled by each pod, but what if it's not that even? Yeah, so uh, on this one, it is like the, 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 the ideal scenario for Keta is where you can have horizontal scale. They're not like they're not having to uh, depend on each other. They're kind of independently horizontally scalable. And I would even say, especially for scaled objects, if processing a single message can happen within some reasonable amount of time, I don't know what the number you'd put on it, like two to three minutes or something. Kata is great when you have longer jobs, like let's say you want to transcode a video. And that transcoding job might take three hours. That's though where you want to use the scaled jobs pattern, where you're spinning up one job per video in this example and spinning it up. So if you do have a scenario that might be a little bit more uh, heterogeneous, as you mentioned, like there's exceptions here and there. I guess the only other one I would mention too, and this came up recently on our Slack channel, shameless plug to code of the Slack channel. Somebody was like, oh, can I scale based on the content of the message? So it's not just that I want to know, are there a thousand messages to be processed? But I want to know, are there a thousand messages and based on the content, to your point, like maybe one of those messages takes three hours and the other messages only take three seconds. Kata today isn't going to know the, the intricacies of that gesture. You're, you're going to need to put something else in the middle. Yeah. Uh, I know Knative has This is basically the use case for Knative, I would say, yeah. Knative eventing, because you need to know the, the specific, what's inside the data, actually, because Kata by its nature doesn't know about the data. It doesn't care about the data. It doesn't handle the data delivery. So I would use some different systems, like Knative eventing or any other eventing solution that requires more complex logic. Yeah. So some variance is okay, but if it's like two hours for one message and 30 seconds, seconds for the next, Kata's going to have a hard time figuring yeah. out the right stuff today, today. Okay, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Zubin, I'll let you choose. I don't know who would have been next. You are close. So how do you scale Kata itself? Ah, uh, yes. You don't scale. <laughs> uh, the scaler that, needs no scale. Yeah, uh, yeah this, is, this is issue because we are relying on Kubernetes uh, API. And unfortunately, there could be only one and uh, one, like let's say, s thing that connects to the to this endpoint that providing that's providing the the data, you know. So there could be one only one metric server per cluster. So we can have multiple replicas of the very same very same metric server, but you cannot plug any other tool. So you can you can scale up the number of um, metric servers, but uh, Kubernetes by default always asks the one, you know. So it. We are trying to we are trying to do the scale, uh, like the scale internally. So basically, we are spawning more processes, etc. But yeah. um, I don't see any big reason for for the for the like actual scaling of of Keda. Yeah, the primary bottleneck though is that custom metrics adapter. You can only have yeah. one, uh, and so Keda Keda. Even if we spin up multiple processes, that's still a. a an yeah, aspect. this is a usual ask that I would like to have multiple Keda installations in my cluster. That's not possible mm -hmm. because of this limitation that you can have only one metric server. So. Even if I have like multiple installations, they will share the very same metric server. We are trying to solve this, those upstream, so, so to have some kind of proxy in, in between, like, between the endpoint, and, but it's still, still stuff that we need to figure out how to do that. So if anyone here has contacts with the uh, custom metrics adapter team, um, yes. I know we've talked with them in the past. But so do we have time for One more. It's got to be a short one. 
before we get kicked out. <laughs> yeah, is there a time you've switched to using GCP's cloud functions or AWS Lambdas? Uh, oh, so it's, this is just an opinion piece at this point because neither of these necessarily would relate directly to Kata. GCP cloud functions or AWS Lambda, you know what? I used to be the, the product lead for Azure Functions, so I would have said neither, Azure Functions. Now I'm in a multi-cloud snowflake world, and I say they're all beautiful. They're yeah. great. I, I, would say, I would say choose the function provider where most of your other stuff is. So if you're already using GC, GCP for a bunch of other stuff, go use the GCP function thing. If you're using AWS, go use the AWS thing. If you're not sure, try to get it to work on Snowflake. That's all I'll say. <laughs> we don't have cloud functions, but just do it anyway. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll be around. They'll probably kick us out. So if you see Zibionek or myself around, let us know. But thank you again so much for coming.